Welcome back to Rethinking Politics, episode 41. Dan and I are here again and ready to talk about the housing market, because why not? The housing market is in the news a lot, and the housing market happens to affect just about everybody, and the housing market is going crazy. In fact, the price of lumber alone right now has spiked to several times as high as it's been in the past. Yeah, so we have a few things going on. First of all, the the cost of homes has gone way up. Whether you're buying a new home that's just been built or you're purchasing a used home from someone else, the prices have continued to skyrocket. On top of that, the prices have gone up to such a degree that it's actually become difficult to purchase a home for the asking price. The number of homes that are being sold above asking price is unusually high, which indicate it indicates a very strong demand. The number of homes that are being sold where people are waiving things like inspections, they're waiving financing requirements, all sorts of things in order to get into a home. Some people are purchasing homes without even seeing them because they're they're trying so hard to find a home. I have a friend who uh, lives in a small little Idaho town up in the Panhandle. It's uh, pretty well known for tourism, but the pricing there, like if you you go up there, there's nothing up there. There's no big cities. (laughs) There's no, they probably have their own little airport that flies to Boise and other little places, right? It's beautiful, but the pricing of houses has skyrocketed. They built a home, they moved into it, and a week later, somebody from California shows up. I assume it's from California. I don't actually know. But I assume somebody from California shows up, offers them something like double what they had paid for it, and they sell their house a short time later and go back to <laughs> back to building their own house or whatever it is they're going to do going forward. Given an offer they couldn't refuse for their house that was not even for sale in an area where normally the amount of people moving in, you probably know a lot of them. Like, just nothing up there. It's not that big. Well, and Dan, Dan, what your friend went through is is what's happening to a lot of people because what we're seeing, in addition to there being a, a housing bubble, is we're seeing a fundamental shift that's occurred in the last year because of a number of things, but primarily because of, of the pandemic and the the natural results from that. We had a large number of people who used to work in person who are now working virtually, a large number of people who, who aren't working but who are still getting a, a fair amount of unemployment. And those two things combined means that you have a lot of people who have stable incomes who are not tied to any physical location. And so that's then a couple of things. It's, number one, it's boosted housing markets in... Not poorer areas, but in areas where property values are lower, like Idaho. Idaho is one of the fastest growing housing markets in the United States right now, if it is not the fastest. I'm not sure if there's another state that's that's had housing prices increase as highly as they have in Idaho. Yeah, I don't know. And so you've got states like Idaho and, and Texas and, and Utah and other places where people are moving out of the big cities, moving to random locations across the United States where housing properties are lower and they're able to get a lot more for the money that they're paying. And then the other thing that's happening, which is really interesting, is that you're actually seeing rental prices go down in the big cities because these people are not leaving homes in cities. They're leaving apartments. And so you've got empty apartments in the cities and overcrowding in the suburbs and small towns. I read an article talking about the prices in that you can, the price for which you can get like a two bedroom apartment in New York. And I read the price and I was like, that's insane. Who pays that much? And they're like, and this is down 50%. Yeah, and they're like, this is the like, best deal we've seen in 10 years. This is years. half off. Right, right, <laughs> right. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, maybe that's. No, maybe and that, that makes good, sense, Dan. That makes sense why you could have someone leave a New York City apartment where they were paying $4,000 a month move to, you know, Idaho or or Texas or wherever and spend $500,000 on a home, which seems like a heck of a lot of money, but then end up paying a mortgage that's about what they were paying for a two-bedroom apartment. (laughs) Right, or less. Or less. Or less. Yeah, likely less. Yeah, I mean, there are people who are selling condos that are worth millions of dollars and then buying homes that are a fraction of that, but far, far larger. 
Right, right. And and you've got to think that in some of these cases, they're probably even keeping their jobs. They're mm-hmm. probably working online at this yeah. point and will for the foreseeable future. Or they're in an area where their job, their business is closed, essentially, and they're and they need not to coming and, back. And do something else, yeah. Right. California and New York are still still very much in, t- in lockdown mode. And there's been talk of this shifting, and some things have shifted. But, but to this day, compared to other states, they're, they are rough. I know people who just went back to school like a week ago. Their kids went back to school. My kids have been in school all year. We're definitely seeing a fundamental shift in where people choose to live in the United States. And it's going to be interesting to see if that shift sticks around, if there's a fundamental change in how people choose to live. Which is interesting to me because I've never understood why so many people wanted to live in New York City in the first place, you know. <laughs> I mean, this is this is something that's been... It's been available at any point. Anyone could have moved to Idaho or any of these other places. They've just... And any other time would have been better. The prices wouldn't have been... You wouldn't have been competing with everybody. No kidding. You'd be better off being like Dan's friend and make a killing in the process. Right. Randomly have people come to your door in the middle of nowhere and offer you lots of money. I have a sister who lives in a small town in Utah near the Salt Lake area. And in the same story, we're like someone she knows... She didn't get an offer. Someone come to her door. But someone was selling their house and ended up selling it for way above their asking price. And she was like, maybe it's time to sell and go somewhere even cheaper, right? Yeah. Get an upgrade. You can you can improve your life. But as you were saying, there are a lot of implications from this. One of them is uh, something that we'll just have to see how it plays out, which is the question of who are these people and how are they going to vote? <laughs> yeah. How are, are uh, – presumably a lot of them are Californians. That's that's what the word is on the street and. Texas and Idaho and yeah, at least Arizona he, at least here in the West, Utah. you've got California yes. bleeding out. I'm sure on the East Coast, you have the same process. Yes, from I was going to say City Florida is probably getting cities moving to Florida and other cheaper locations. Yes, and and obviously a significant reason for why people are doing this beyond is, is COVID, as you said. Some of it is also taxes and different government regulations. Beyond COVID, there is a something of a celebrity push on that front. A lot of prominent Republican talk show people and pundits have left California and other places and have fled to these other states. And I get the sense that they're taking a lot of people with them. And I would assume that that people of a political alignment that endorses more freedom than you're seeing in California or New York, whether that be just that you're you're some moderate Democrat or you're you're more of the on the libertarian left or whatever it may be, or a Republican of some kind or libertarian, then you're you're at least considering leaving some of these places where where the taxes seem to only go up and where there's so much regulation and whatnot and where the price of living is is so high. But I'm curious for the next exit polling. I'm curious to see what happens in state voting and things as a product of this. Are the numbers actually enough to swing some of these states? Are they what? Who actually is leaving? Mm -hmm. And all of this, we only have uh, basically speculation at this point, anecdotal information about people coming in and changing school districts. And (laughs) I know some people in Arizona who their school district immediately, as they reported, taken over by crazy people from California and. But again, all of that's anecdotal. We'll see what happens. But as far as economics go, this is a really interesting way to understand and and learn some of the things about around supply and demand. There's a few different ways to look at what's happening. You know, the first is is the most obvious that that there are not enough homes in the areas where people are now choosing to live. You know, in all of these new locations, we don't have enough homes. In addition, part of the thing about a a mass migration like this is that it's going to create at least temporarily some waste. You know what I mean? That if you have more apartments that are unoccupied, it means that that what, what you need in order for everyone to be housed is you have to have some kind of shift. You need to convince people who are living in homes to come move into these apartments Otherwise, you're not going to have enough places for everyone to live. Just on the on the simplest version of that, you know what I mean? And so, and so <laughs> yeah, that we have a set amount of housing per se and various kinds. Yeah, and more people want a different kind of housing than exists. <laughs> yeah, there are only so many houses on the market. And the other the other factor you have to look in in terms of supply and demand is that there are a lot of people who are in homes who are unwilling to sell 
because they're afraid they won't be able to buy another home to move into, especially if you're not planning on moving, Dan. If you're not planning on moving out of your city and your home has doubled in value, but so has everyone else's home, if you sell your home, now you have to go find another home. And what if it's increased in the five days that it takes you to buy a new home? What if you're the one chasing down a seller so that you can, you know, so you can buy a home and you waive fees and then you end up potentially lose thousands upon thousands of dollars versus staying in your own home where you know that everything is is functioning, hopefully. Yeah, you're already locked into a loan that was less than market value and you can hope that And on that subject, with what the Fed has done to interest rates, almost everyone who's in a home who has a mortgage, at least for a few years, is able to refinance. Assuming they they have decent credit and all of these other factors, they're able to refinance and significantly lower their mortgage. Almost everyone I know who owns a home has done this in the last... If they haven't done it recently, they've done it in the last year. I've heard of people saving hundreds of dollars a month just by refinancing because of the new insurance rates, which is another <laughs> strong incentive to stay in your home because however much money you're you're earning, your income has stayed the same and now you're paying less, things are looking pretty good right now, you know? That almost sounded like the beginning of an advertisement. I know so many people who saved hundreds of dollars a month on their mortgage. So yeah, they save fifteen percent or more. <laughs> right, right. What are you living under a rock? <laughs> no, but but we're talking about skewed incentives here where things are really weird, where people don't want to live in these apartments anymore. They have much better options uh, elsewhere, but the, those people who are living in those homes don't want to move out. And so there aren't enough homes. Right. And this is when you say there's not enough houses for the people who want houses. The, the evidence of that is literally in the fact that the prices are going up because there's so much demand. People are bidding up the prices. Mm-hmm. You you want to sell the house for 250000 but then there's six people who want it, and one of them wants, you know, and they want it more than the others. And they're like, well, I'll give you 10 extra thousand, and so on. And the price goes up because the demand for it has increased. And so the value of the good, you increase the value of the good, the sell price of the house, until there is just one person who demands it. Because you only need one person to move into your house, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're like, so you, that's the idea that there's a natural pressure that pushes up the price of these houses. Is this a permanent increase in prices? Of course not. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> the market adjusts to this, right? You get people who go, wait, I could have built a house and sold it for 300000 last year. But if I do it now, I can sell it for 600000 Let's build more houses. Mm -hmm. So the incentive of construction crews and investment in construction in these areas is going to skyrocket. But again, that'll be temporary, right? Until they they deal with this problem, in which case the prices will return. And of course, everyone's immediate response to that, Dan, is, well, have you seen the cost of lumber? Yes, yes, we have. The, the, (laughs) The cost of lumber has gone up an estimated 375% year over year. It makes sense that it's increased and it probably hasn't peaked yet either. Which is a significant impact. The last report I looked at said that they were estimating it costs an extra 40 grand to build a new home primarily because of increased lumber costs. (laughs) And almost sheer wood costs. That's crazy. Which is crazy. Material cost. But the other thing is that as people are rushing to build these homes, there's going to be a delay because building homes takes a Mm -hmm. long time. So if right now you have an increased demand, a demand so high that me as a builder, I would shrug off 40 grand. If I'm going to build a house for 340 grand instead of 300, but I can sell it for 600,000, that's still not a problem. Yeah. That's still going to incentivize me to build as much as I can, but there'll be a delayed effect in terms of of seeing those results, of seeing that equilibrium be reached there's going to be a little bit of time yeah and and you'll see that because the wood price has increased right what this reflects is a shortage of wood that there is not enough wood to go to all of the things that people are using wood for and the price is going up so that the wood is being used only in the things that are most effective most profitable just like that price of the house goes up because the demand for it goes up you've got 10 people who want a house and there's one house The person who will pay the most for it is the one who gets it. With wood, wood is interesting because it's used as a means to an end, right? It's it's used to 
it's not the end good itself. It's something you're going to use in construction. Yeah, people aren't buying wood because they want to have wood. Right. So if you're building a house in California right now, are you willing to pay the increased price? Because houses are probably worth less given that people are leaving. Maybe. I don't, I don't know exactly. It might depend on the area. But presumably, demand is down at least a little bit in California. And thus, you're now paying more to build a house that is worth less. Whereas in other areas, like these Western areas we've been talking about, you were paying more, but you were getting way more out of it. You imagine that because of the increase in cost, that's not going to uh, limit construction per se. What it will do is it will limit construction in areas where it's not as profitable, but construction in places where it's very profitable is going to continue anyway. The wood will be diverted essentially to the West where there will be far more construction. And the prices will continue to skyrocket to, to uh, try and address that. So it's going to the place where it's most valuable. And this is a function of price that people just don't understand. You get a lot of people will look at this and they'll be like, this is why you need to have price controls. Like you do that and you go, okay, then you really will run out of wood. <laughs> you, you will run out of wood entirely. And you won't have it diverted to the most useful things. You'll have it, you'll, you'll just simply be out of it. And so you have this supply and demand that's affecting where resources are being allocated, what people are doing, and, and, and all of this. And what everyone's wondering with this housing market is what's going to happen. You know, right now, people are concerned that it's going to continue to rise, which is obviously affecting people's choices. People who are in homes are choosing not to sell because they think prices are going to go up. People right now are actually being encouraged to buy homes because prices are going to continue to go up. If you have not purchased a home before, they say purchase one now because then maybe a year from now your home will be worth double. And so that's actually going to continue to drive demand. The belief that there is demand will actually drive demand. Yes, for people trying to make money on it. Mm -hmm. Influences do play in a big, a big factor. These psychological factors have a play in what's happening. Clearly, you can tell I'm on vacation. Word talk be hard for me. Brad has had not one, not two, but three root beers before this. So he may be a little tipsy. It's, it's not even noon where he's at. But hey, it's vacation. What's a few glasses before lunch? Anyways, you need to understand the root cause of what's happening and, and what these original factors are. Because if those factors shift then you could have a shift in what the market is doing. We talked earlier about all these people leaving these big cities because of a combination of things, the virtual work from home, the regulations that are put in place in these cities that are slowing businesses, reducing how many jobs are actually available there. Those things could shift. Massive rises in crime. If these businesses say, hey, we want you to come back or we're going to hire somebody else, Either way, that's going to bring people back to those cities. If those cities open up and businesses that were closed resume, that's going to drive people back. Whether it's the same people or different people in terms of grand scale doesn't actually matter. What matters is the migration, is the shift. Because unless these cities stay empty, you know, unless this migration is permanent then there's going to be some kind of whiplash effect. And odds are at some point that's going to happen because rent prices in these cities have gone down because these places aren't going down, the other places are going up. And so the incentives underneath what's happening, underneath the regulations, the jobs have shifted so that if those original factors changed, there would actually be more reason to move back to the city than there was before. If you were working a job making such and such an amount and paying $4,000 a month for rent, and now you can work that same job and make and pay 2000 a month on rent, that's a big difference, right. you know, in terms of an incentive. Right, right. You're just getting You know, paid. there may be a whole nother group of people who choose to leave the suburbs, sell their home for 600000 instead of 300000 and then take that apartment and that job. Yeah, I've got to believe that, that as you said, there will, at some point, probably in the relatively near future, be a move back. One of the things we mentioned people don't like, I've, I've never seen the appeal of New York per se either, but 
part of the appeal is certainly the the food and the many small, you know, famous food places that people go to that are all closed right now. But more than anything, it's the high paying jobs. You know, it's yes, the, yes. it's all the industry yes, there. Right, right. And a lot of that is right. closed. All the cultural things are closed. The food, the you know, the all the things that you would you would go to see to participate in culturally and in socially, essentially are closed. And then you close a number of businesses down too. Uh, obviously, people are going to leave, right? Obviously, they're going to leave. And when you open those things back up, and as you said, cost of living is down because so many people have left. Yes, people are going to come back unless you perpetuate the silly things that have convinced people to leave. Then they will eventually come back. We talked about arbitrary job loss, right? Barriers just straight up imposed by the states. This is similar. It's because of things like that that people are leaving. And people will return when they're gone. And the thing is, it doesn't have to be even as many people as left in the first place in order to have that whiplash effect because of the increased demand for new houses. More new homes are being built than were being built before, which means there are going to be more new homes on the market. So you combine even a a small chunk of people who left coming back or being replaced by other people who who are choosing to go back to the cities, combined with these new homes getting to the market for the first time, which could trigger even a small decrease in house prices, which would then change the psychological factor of knowing the housing prices will always yes, going up yes. to being afraid that maybe they'll go down. And next thing you know, excitement turns to panic and you could have a full-blown, you know, housing market collapse. Right. You never know how many people are buying the houses to use them and how many of them are buying them as an investment. And as you said, once once the demand is met, people start moving back to the cities, you're going to have a lot of people holding the houses as investment, not using them. And those people will start all trying to get rid of those houses at the same time and collapse. Prices will collapse. There's always these we were joking about it before. We were looking at articles on housing prices to try and gauge, trying to look for things like what percent they've increased, you know, in what areas, those kind of things. And Brad, you were telling me what you you found some, what, what instead you found was constant reassurances. <laughs> it's funny because every news site that I use has mentioned the fact that people are asking if there's going to be a housing market crash and how soon it will be in all of these questions. And every single news article has taken time to explain how this is not like the market crash before, which is accurate. This is different. This is different. And and <laughs> this taking bubble time to is exp- different. No, it's no, it's <laughs> it's true. It's true. This is a completely different bubble. Obviously, obviously, the last year has been different than any year before. I mean, unless you were here in 1918, this is different. You know, this is a unique experience, but it doesn't mean their economic factors aren't going to still play out. You know, there are there are rules to these games, and just because the game's different doesn't mean there aren't still rules. But it's interesting because all of these sites have been so reassuring in letting me know that the housing market is not going to crash. You know, it may cool, it may have a market correction, and they use a few <laughs> other words like that, which are funny because those words fundamentally mean the same thing, that it's going to shift away. The prices are going to start and, going down and, instead of up. Yeah, And really the, the biggest thing that they're not f- capturing, I think, is that psychological impact of having the market cool, of having there be a correction. Their assumption is that this is really 90% legitimate and 10% overinflated, you know, that the majority of this shift is permanent and only a small part needs to be corrected. And I I just don't think that's accurate. I think that this last year has been so crazy for so many people that a lot of people have made big life changes, which is not bad. Yes. But it means that people are going to be prone to making another big life change or going back to what they were doing before. You know, it's going to lead people to be afraid and to panic. And I think that's something that we're definitely going to see that accompanying any cool down or any market correction that could easily lead to a crash. Right. And just as we were talking about with the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve 
always says the market outlook is good. Because if they say anything else, the market will have problems even if the market outlook is good, is, is, mm-hmm. is ultimately good, and they just didn't realize. When you're, when you're starting to look at articles on housing, and this is not even what you were looking for, but it's what's being said everywhere when everyone is telling you it's going to be okay. There's not going to be a problem. And then they'd use words like market correction and cool down. <laughs> like, as you said, this is the same thing. Like this, in some ways, I wonder, at least become sus when I encounter such a consistent message that everything's going to be fine on issues where convincing you it's fine has an impact on the economic outcome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That you, you wonder how honest these people would feel like being. Because if someone's, someone's out there being like, it's all going to fall apart. That has an impact. And if you get a, yeah. a number of voices saying that, talk about economics is almost always disingenuous, especially from politicians. Because in some cases, the costs that can be hidden under just positivity and the perception of the people, because that's partially what <laughs> keeps the value up, right? A lie believed does affect prices, even when if they correctly assess the situation, the prices would, would then change and, and the market would correct. And you want the market to correct. That's the thing. You do want corrections. You do want the prices to adapt to the actual supply and demand and to reflect the actual reality so that investments go into the right places in ways that make us more productive and thus more wealthy. Not if you're a politician, necessarily. And not if you're a news site, necessarily, (laughs) right? (laughs) These, maybe not then. Maybe you want other things. Maybe you want things to at least appear to be good, especially if your guy's uh, the one that's going to get blamed one way or the other. What's interesting about the decrease in prices from the cities and the increase of prices often in rural areas and or at least smaller cities is that it's the exact opposite of what we usually see. We usually see increasing prices in the most valuable areas in cities, places like New York, places like San Francisco. Now, New York is something of a of a unique case in that its geography is particularly limiting. But San Francisco is a case in point of how government can cause this effect. Yes, there are areas that because of their proximity to work, because of their proximity to the beach and different things like that, there is a limited amount of space and lots of people who want to live there. And thus the the limited supply and the high demand is going to drive the prices higher. But San Francisco, in many cases, suffers from ridiculous high, ridiculously high prices because they will not build more houses. (laughs) It's really like if you've got lots of people who want houses and apartments and you do not let them build houses and apartments, prices go up. You're artificially limiting the supply. Yep. And this can happen in a variety of ways. Often it's from some kind of land preservation where they're like, You know, this area here is prime real estate. This would be ideal for a lot of people. We could build a lot of homes that would give people access to all kinds of things. And we're not going to let you build there. We're going to, we're going to protect this. We're going to keep some green space here and, and keep the cost low that way. And that in turn makes the cost way higher. And some areas don't seem to do this that much. Dallas is a good example of a place where right now you could sell your house in rural Idaho or Utah and move to Dallas and get way more for your money. That seems Mm -hmm. ridiculous. Like, that is not how cities usually work. But it's entirely a product of the fact that Dallas is like, it's fine. We're just going to sprawl. You want want a house? Build a house. Go for it. And there are lots of places that do that. I'm here in vacation in Phoenix, and Phoenix has millions and millions of people living here. Like, this, this place is is crowded the number of people who live in phoenix is out of control it is and but they've kept housing prices have stayed reasonable because it just keeps growing sideways yes you know it's just it's just continued to expand horizontally which has been able to allow people to live here and continue to live here reasonably and it's horizontal i I don't know the geography well it's horizontal because of mountains along it's the north is that right no i meant horizontally instead of vertically Instead of having a skyscraper, oh, I build see. a house next door. I see. I was going to say, because I know, I know like uh, the, the Utah Valley, the Salt Lake, there you run up against mountains. And so mm-hmm, it makes mm-hmm. sense that that's a lot of people don't want to live there. But there are other directions that it can grow in that it doesn't. And you look at those and you're like, prime real estate right there, across the street, nothing. Why? 
And you know there that there's some kind of government regulation or, in many cases, federally owned land. This is a, a huge factor that a lot of people don't think about in terms of housing costs, that one of the primary drivers in housing costs is the property value itself, which, which you'd expect in a city. You know, you'd expect that an acre of land in downtown Manhattan is going to be incredibly expensive. I don't even know what that would retail for, but I know that there are areas of Manhattan where it can cost you, you know, close to a million dollars for a parking spot. Uh -huh. It gets out of control. It gets out of control. You compare that with like when you're driving on a road trip or something and you're out in the middle of nowhere and you see like a house off in the distance. And you're like, who lives there? <laughs> yeah. That that guy must have paid nothing for his land in con comparison to the person getting prime real estate in, in a downtown of a major city. But the thing is, is that even in these other areas, even in these these western areas where people are are moving to, in fact, especially in these areas, huge chunks of these areas are located by the federal government. In fact, 28% of the entire land mass of the United States of America is owned by the federal government, a quarter. An entire quarter is owned by the federal government. And the vast majority of that federal land is actually located in these western states where property values have skyrocketed because of this mass migration. You can look up maps of this that highlight federally owned land, and you'll be like, there's almost zero in the eastern half of the United States. And then there's just massive chunks in the Western. And like places like Utah, it's what is it, 65% of the land in Utah yeah, is federally yeah, just owned. About. And the thing that's interesting about that is the argument has always been that federally owned land is because of things like national parks and other things that the federal government is trying to preserve and protect, as well as, you know, federal buildings and things like that. That's all a bunch of hogwash. And you'll know that if you look at those maps, because the East Coast, believe it or not, has national parks, has national monuments, has historic sites, all owned by the federal government, protected and preserved. And yet the federal government only owns a few percent of each of those states. And that's because I think we failed to grasp how huge this country is. It's absolutely insane how much space we're actually talking about. So I actually looked up some numbers to gain a little perspective. The federal government owns roughly 640 million acres, which is, like I said, 28% of the just over 2 billion acres of land in the United States. So what does that actually look like? 640 million acres? Well, to give you some perspective, every single national park in the United States combined is only 85 million acres. So a mere fraction of the federally Less than owned a land That's crazy. is all the national parks combined. So even if you kept every single national park, you would still have about 560 million acres of federally owned land. I didn't know this. So what's the rest of it? <laughs> that's an excellent question, Dan. <laughs> that is an excellent question. So I live in Utah, and down in St. George, which St. George is a desert, there's, there's some beautiful areas, and there's also a whole lot of dirt. And, and on that dirt, there are, there are sagebrush. There are a few other plants, most of which I hate. They're not nice. They're not beautiful. There's very little water. I mean, you guys know deserts, right? But it's not even like a beautiful Saharan desert. No. This is a high desert, yeah. American prairie desert that's just... It's just fine. It's fine. It's ground. It's ground. But to say that this ground is special in any ways, it hurts my brain. Truly, truly. The, I mean, the Mormons fled to Utah in part of American history, right? They, the Mormons leave the beautiful Nauvoo, which they cultivated out of a swamp, and then they, they flee west across this wasteland of a world to Utah. And Brigham Young, the leader at the time, says, this is the place. And I just imagine that anyone with him looking at that area was like, <laughs> this, this is the place. Like, not, it's fine now. Utah's fine now. It's better than Phoenix, right? Phoenix is like, it's way better than is Phoenix. It's unlivable without air, air conditioning and things. But it's, it is not, they created something out of nothing. Let's put it that way. They created something out of nothing. 
But you look at this land and you look at these these sections that are owned by the federal government. For example, in St. George, there's this area called the Red Cliffs Preservation Area or something like that. It's a combination of state and federal control, and it's just this empty space, right? And it's there because there are some pretty red cliffs. But they don't just preserve the cliffs. They preserve miles around the cliffs, right? And so I'm looking at the cliffs, and their cliffs are about five miles away, and the land I'm standing on is this empty sagebrush land, and it's all federally protected. And that's what so many of these areas are, is these vast stretches of land that are just empty, that aren't even worth making into a national park or a state park or anything. And it just sits there. <laughs> and that's huge chunks of the United States are these areas of land that just sit there. In fact, here's here's a good way of, of putting it in perspective. So you take out the national parks, which brings us down to 560 million acres. You take out an extra 200 million. Let's say we want to preserve some monuments. We want to have some federally owned land. We just want to be on the conservative side, right? Anything that might be worth preserving, let's preserve it. I'm not arguing against that at all. That still leaves you with about 350 million acres of federal land that's just sitting there. What does that equate to, Dan? That equates to having enough to give every single person, every single man, woman, and child in the United States an entire acre of land. <laughs> yeah. Which is which is a lot. An <laughs> acre is much bigger than an, any person's the most average house slots. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's almost as big as a football field, which is which is quite large. That's insane. And it and that's just sitting there. It's just, just it land just that's sitting, sitting there. there. It's not productive, and it's not preserving anything, wildlife or otherwise. Yeah, because most people assume that the purpose of this land is to preserve nature and all its beauty. Such people haven't driven through Utah and Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that most of this land is is just land and and at some point at some point, Dan, a conversation needs to be had about whether or not we as human beings are allowed to live here as well. Because if we are, then maybe it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for us to use some of that land. Like I said, not the national parks, not these these national monuments. Just the land that's sitting there that that's just sitting there. The irony is that I mean most people wouldn't even want an acre of that land. But you could but in so many cases, it's in good locations, land like this, that, that doesn't have any real nothing really there to preserve, nothing of, mm -hmm. of beauty, none of the wildlife aren't in danger, none of these things. And yet it's right there, and including, as you said, in a place like St. George, where right up Next to one of the cities is an area like this where all of that land would be used and it would be really productive mm -hmm. and it would be really helpful and you could do all kinds of things with it. No, and, and you look at a city like Phoenix. Phoenix has no reason to exist. The reason Phoenix exists is because of all of the federally owned land in all the other states that people would have moved to, would have used. But it was blocked. <laughs> and so and so someone saw Phoenix and said, hey, here's land that the federal government is fine not owning. And so we can actually build a city here for cheap. And people continue to move here because of that low cost. You could have other cities pop up in the middle of nowhere if you got rid of some of this federally owned land. That people would be happy to move to the middle of nowhere. Right. Because guess what? We can build freeways. We can build airports. You know, we've got the technology to make this work, especially if you're talking about saving hundreds of thousands of dollars just on property costs alone. Yes, yes. And to say nothing of the resources that we're, that the federal land blocks us from using, right? significant amounts of of easily accessible oil in various forms that would cause far from the pollution that it causes in other countries where it's produced and so on. Um, there's massive amounts of, of natural reserves of oil that we're not using that's entirely because it's part of this federal land. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because we as Americans are so opposed to using any natural resources in the United States. And I feel like people just aren't grasping the size of the United States, the quantity of resources that are actually available here versus the population. You know, you look at places like Great Britain where you have 80 million people 
living on an island the the size of of one of the 13 original colonies you know <laughs> a, such a small fraction of the united states and yet they're able to exist and we're acting as if that was us we're acting as if we're all here living on this tiny little island and we need to be very very careful we need to live within these small contained cities it just doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense for us to live in these ecological protection zones <laughs> right at the end of the day every choice we make is an economic one right you know we we give something up in order to gain something else and that is true when it comes to land as well anytime you choose to use land for something you can't use it for something else that's true of this federal land as well i understand the appeal of wanting to keep the united states as it is but we have a choice to make because anytime we use any land for anything, we're giving something up. If we truly want the United States to just be preserved without any changes being made, that means our only option is to leave the United States and leave the entire country as a, a wilderness preserve. We're going to move into space. Yeah, no, no, seriously. <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is, is that is that we're here now and there are people who can't afford to live in homes, there are people who are in poverty, these concerns can be alleviated at the cost of tearing up the sagebrush and building a home there instead. And so you have to weigh that economic cost. You have to say, is the sagebrush more important than fighting poverty? Right, the people living on the streets because they can't afford the rising prices. Yeah. Because that's the choice we're making right now. That's the choice we've said yes the sagebrush next to St. George is more important than these people who are homeless or are destitute or are forced to live in a two-bedroom apartment because they can't afford to buy a home. And maybe you believe that that's true, but I believe that most people in the United States, if presented that choice, stated that way, would say, no, tear up the sagebrush, let's build some new homes. But the fact is, is that most people don't realize that's the case. Most people aren't presented with it that way. Most people are presented with, well, would you like to uh, build more mansions for the rich or would you like to preserve the Grand Canyon? Yeah. yeah. And they're like, no, preserve the Grand Canyon. <laughs> would you like Jeff Bezos to be wealthier or would you like to keep Zion National Park, you know, with all of its beauty? You're absolutely right. And there is in there a few assumptions that are worth addressing. And one of them is that what happens when man controls land is it is exploited, it is destroyed, it is polluted, and then we move on. What people imagine when they think you've got this wild land and maybe it's not beautiful, or maybe it is, maybe it is the wasteland of Arizona or the desert of Idaho and Utah. And no one's living there, but at least the water isn't full of trash, right? At least, at least an animal could come and drink from that that creek that's there only part of the year because it never rains <laughs> because there's no moisture in these places <laughs> i'll never forget when we uh when my wife and i drove into texas for the first time we've never been to texas we're on our way to the dallas area and there is a rainstorm and i have never seen so much moisture coming out of the sky it was insane. I, I felt like I was watching rain for the first time in my life. I saw more water fall out of the sky that night than I see in probably any 10 rains in Idaho. And that's, and that's not even right. It's more than that. But anyway, I, I digress. In Idaho, you get buildup of snow and things, and that's the only time you see moisture. <laughs> you swim in a canal, it's snow runoff. It's freezing. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not bitter um so just bitter cold <laughs> just bitter cold just freezing i don't even remember what i was talking about oh that idea comes from uh, a certain there's a certain economic term that people use when they talk about this kind of thing it's called the tragedy of the commons you have an example where where if you open up an area for logging what happens is greedy businesses come in and they chop down all the trees as fast as possible so that they can make a profit right you want, to, you want to cut down as much wood makes you money. The more wood you have, the more money you have. The goal is to 
chop as much of it down as fast as possible because in some sense you're competing with the other people chopping it down, right? So if you get – you want to get more of it than they do. Yeah. yeah, there's no incentive for a business to preserve the forest if anyone else can cut down the trees before them. Right. So it causes the incentive to be to get as much as you can as quickly as you can and not care at all about preserving the resource. Yeah, especially if more wood equals more money, right? This is a direct, direct motivation for them to destroy nature. All of this is partially right, but wrong in absolutely critical ways. And one of them is the way that Brad, Brad just suggested there. The fundamental problem with this, this, this tragedy of the commons, as it's called, is called the tragedy of the commons because it happens in things that are commonly owned. They're owned in common. Things that everyone owns. So, as he said, the reason you get this, because everyone's cutting it down anyway, and you might as well cut more of it down than they do. Right? You, if you want to get more profit, you need to consume it faster than they do. But there's an easy solution to this problem. Privatize it. Don't let it be owned in common. When someone owns a home, they don't let it fall apart because it's theirs. Their incentives shift as soon as you own it. Right. And this is, this is not intuitive if you've, you hear the common myths, right? People just absorb these things and they go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. People, people wanting to make a profit want to make the profit faster if they can, and that will destroy things. And there's no – businesses have no incentive to stop. And that is entirely BS. And if you have privately owned land and you go see how it's treated, you will find that it is actually most profitable to manage land in a sustainable manner. And the reason for this is very simple. There is a certain demand for wood. And if you go and you log lots of wood beyond that demand, the price for wood in the market will drop. You'll have to lower your prices. And if you log more, then the price will continue to go down. And so what you're trying to do is you're aiming to log enough wood to maximize your profit relative to the cost of logging that amount. To log more wood costs you more money, and to log more wood makes the wood worth less per unit, because as the supply increases, cost goes down, just as where when demand increases, cost goes up. And so you actually have an incentive to do it at a rate that hits a certain level of demand, where you're maximizing your profits, and to continue to do that across time, which means... You don't want to log out the whole forest at once. That will be a very terrible way to manage the resource. That will be a way that hurts your profits. I imagine that what happens when someone actually gets this, who is from one of these kind of these perspectives that's very environmental, is that something explodes in their head. You know, that classic, classic image. <laughs> like, wait, 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 wait. Businesses are incentivized us to be profitable. Profit does not leads you to consume it all at once. In fact, it leads you to provide a steady and consistent output that is sustainable across time that maximizes the initial investment into the tools and into the land and into these other things. And this is why when you privatize the land, what happens, and this is, you can prove this, you can look at this with logging and see how companies do this. They will plant lots and lots of trees and they will grow those trees. They will rotate where they're logging and so that they always have trees that they can cut down, and they're always managing it at a very careful level rather than logging things out. And this, and all of this makes perfect economic sense. And this, this is what wise people do. And those incentives change if the land is owned in common. This is why overfishing in the ocean is a huge problem. Because there's no ownership, because there's no accountability. Right, and, and so if you, if you know that the resource is going to be drained anyway, your incentive becomes, well, I'll just get as much as I can before it's too late. And specifically in, re in regards to the forests, you know, in the United States, 60% of forest land is already privately owned. That's a crazy high amount. <laughs> it is. The majority of the forest in the United States is not owned by state, local, or federal governments at all. Which means that if Dan's wrong, and people who privately own the forest are just going to immediately sell it off, because it's worth a lot. You know, that 60% of the forest land in the United States, if you sold that to, to a lumber company, that's a lot of money. You know, each of these acres is worth 
over a thousand dollars in terms of of the lumber you can get from it and so if you have millions of acres that's a lot of money that quickly becomes billions of dollars so all this money is just there for the taking which means that if dan's wrong then we should go from having you know 741 million acres of forest land which is what we have now to something around 300 million acres you know half of it should be gone in almost an instant overnight but it's not because those people who privately own that forest land which is a num you know millions of people spread throughout the united states are choosing to be sustainable because it aligns with their incentives right because privatization does work and has worked and is continuing to work <laughs> right, in the right. United States. Just quietly. And so people don't people yeah. don't realize it. It's now, not exciting, but it's happening. <laughs> it's, not, it's not exciting. It's not newsworthy that people happen to take care of their stuff. But but it but it should be because uh it it explains a lot of trends that are otherwise inexplicable, like the fact that the US has basically the same level of foresting in it, the same amount of forests in it that it did a hundred years ago, despite the fact we've clearly used a ton of wood. And that just goes back to, to a number of things that, that we're talking about here. There are a lot of natural resources, and it's okay to let people use those resources, whether it's forests, whether it's land, whether it's oil underneath the ground. And businesses' natural inclination is not to destroy. People's natural inclination is not to destroy. It is to use and to use responsibly when they're invested when they have ownership. And that is where the uh, tragedy of the commons is correct, that when people don't have a stake, they don't care. And that's actually what we want to get away from, that when we allow people to own things, then they're going to take care of them. And so the solution to taking care of these natural resources is to allow people to have them. Let the federal government allow people to start taking possession of these large empty spaces, allow people to harvest them of these natural resources and give them a stake, give them an investment, and it will pay off. And on the flip side, it will allow people to solve so many of their own problems by getting out of the way. It will allow us to fix things like the housing crisis, people not being able to afford a home unless they can pony up half a million dollars. It will allow us to to deal with things like lumber prices increasing by 375% <laughs> because there there are things that can be done. Right. It won't cure them, but it will ease it in a number of ways and allow people to address it quicker, right? Allow people to adjust to the supply and demand better. Because as we've talked about before, and as I talked about earlier in this episode, every one of these decisions are uh, a choice between one of two things, you know, and every time you pick something, you're giving something else up. And what we want is to allow people to make that choice as much as possible so that they can better themselves. And with that, thank you for listening. This has been episode 41 of Rethinking Politics. You can find us on all of the major podcasting apps. You can reach out to us at our website, which is rethinkingpolitics.podbean.com, where you can find a link to our Patreon account if you'd like to support us there. You can also reach us on all the social media apps, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can reach out to us at our email at